It's lovely to be with you again. And um, it's in daylight. I think the last time I came, it was very dark indeed. And what with these bright lights, wow, it could be summer. Um, greetings from the church down at Newtown. Um, we met this morning and um, meeting again they are now and they'll be praying for us I'm sure as we will pray later for God's work across our nation and beyond. But I'm going to start by reading just a few verses from Psalm 103. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Psalm 103, the first six verses, then the last four. Psalm 103 is headed, Praise for the Lord's mercies, a psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Then verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. You'll see why I put this next item in later on in the service, so stay listening. John Lang, or as he later became Sir John Lang, I'm sure many of you know his story, but if you do, I'll remind you, if you don't, I'll tell you a little bit about him. John Lang loved being outdoors, especially on the Lakeland Fells. But on this day in September 1909, when he was 30, he was not in the mood for walking. He sat alone on a grassy slope overlooking the Irish Sea with his head in his hands in despair. Ever since he became head of the family building firm, he had wanted to start building things like power stations and reservoirs instead of just building houses. But everything had gone wrong with the job they were now doing and the family firm might become bankrupt. Apart from the shame of failure, John knew that his parents were relying on him to keep them in their old age and that the men who worked for him would lose their jobs. But John Lang knew where to find help when he was in trouble. He could always ask God. So he asked God simply to show him a way through his troubles and promised to make him a partner in the business if he would help. And he wrote down from that the kind of response he got from God and the way in which the Lord spoke to him clearly as to what he had to do. He resolved, with the help of the Lord, to enjoy life, have God at the centre of his life, though, and help others to do the same. And he wrote this down and kept it with him throughout his life, this piece of paper. Alongside this, he made a promise that he would be wise and generous with his money, always giving a percentage away, living on very little. In fact, when he died, you'll know this, I'm sure, John Lang's personal fortune was all of £400. This is 1979 when he died, but nevertheless, that was not much for a man who had made lots and lots of money. Well, he was born in 1879 in Carlisle. The family biz building business was just a few years old, and his father ran it. 
Young John earned his first wage when he was just 12 by wallpapering his parents' house. He was given one shilling per room for that. And he developed his skills. He worked alongside in the family business, left school at 15 to become a formal apprentice in that business. Well, the Lang family belonged to a thriving Brethren church in Carlisle, where John learned about having faith in God. He came to love the Bible, and the fellowship there helped one another. He saw that. At the age of seven, John made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ, which would shape his whole life. He would talk to others about his faith, talk to others about the Lord Jesus, particularly loved talking to young people and later organised regular camps for teenagers, leading expeditions into the hills. He became a leader in the church, which was most important to him. Well, he married in September 1910, Beatrice, and... She too was a true believer. Their marriage was a deeply happy one. Well, the business, after that time when he he was having that problem, began to develop and grow. And you will know, you'll have seen the signs with land construction, certainly during the, the 20th century. I looked them up and actually you don't see them now because they got taken over. But... Certainly, they were a big, big company, weren't they? Um, Certainly, when I was growing up. John Lang was a leader of his industry and was often consulted by government ministers. He was knighted in the New Year's Honours list of 1959, when he was 79. Although he was delighted, he saw that this award recognised the achievements of many people that he had worked with. But it wasn't just that side of the work. He was so interested in people. He wanted people to hear the gospel, but he also wanted to be a good employer. In the early years of the 20th century, building workers had a hard time. They didn't have the sort of machines they have nowadays. Everything had to be done with muscle power. Very few employers thought about their workers. Businesses operated on the principle of buy cheapest, sell dearest. John Lang realised that this was not what Jesus taught. One account tells of a workman on one of Lang's building sites who was hard at work, winding a crane by hand. Can you imagine that? Although working well, his thoughts were not really on his job. John Lang came by and noticed all was not well. You're not looking well. What's the trouble? The man explained, my wife is ill and has been in bed for several days. I have to see to the children each morning and do all the housework before I start work here at 7am. Where do you live? asked John Lang, who then left the site. An hour or two later, he came back. You are needed at home, he said. Take two weeks off with pay. When the man went home, He found that John Lang had been there and left five pounds on the table. Another story tells of two men who were having lunch in a canteen on a Lang site. Do you really expect us to eat this stuff? They jeered as they queued for their food. Dodging the rain which came in through holes in the roof, they found a table and started to eat. The old man is visiting the site today. I bet he won't be sitting in this rotten canteen eating eating this rubbish, said one. They took no notice of a man in an old raincoat who was sitting nearby, but he listened carefully to what they said. The next day, a new roof was put on the canteen and better food was provided. The man in the raincoat was, of course, John Lang finding out how his men lived and doing his best to improve their lives. Well, there's more here, and I won't go into detail, but obviously Langs were the ones who rebuilt Coventry Cathedral 
after the bombings had destroyed the, the one in the Second World War, well, they had the contract for the new cathedral. And the Queen came to the consecration service in May 1962, and Sir John was determined to attend, although he was quite frail. He only stopped himself from falling during the service by holding on to the chair in front of him. Well, he died, as I said, in, well, actually, 1978, at the age of 99, with just £400 in his personal funds. What had he done with the money? Well, he hadn't frittered it away, had not hidden it in a Swiss bank account or anything like that. He'd given it out. He set up a foundation, a charitable trust. He gave a lot of money to Sunday school and other programs that still run today. He gave money to universities, colleges, book publishers to promote the study of Christianity. A rich man, a man who could have lived in luxury, lived in a modest, comparatively modest house. He knew he'd be given those riches by God and he used them for God's glory. Well, you'll see where that links up later on. Please turn in your Bibles to James' letter. James chapter 1 and the first 18 verses we'll be reading. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation... For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. Well, if you keep that passage open, we'll be looking at verses 9 through to 11 later. Don't know about you, but one of the worst things that you can find is not being able to sleep. Having a sleepless night. Not good, is it? And sometimes people's worries keep them awake. Things of life stress them out. And you hear about it more and more in our society. What am I going to do this week to make ends meet? How can I keep my job, what is, which is under threat? What about my child? They're causing me some anguish. Money worries seem to have come in more and more, don't they, with the, the crisis, the cost of living crisis 
that we have. And they can keep us on edge and awake at night. Many people in our society have that. Conversely, other people, maybe in a different part of town, are tossing and turning and they might have totally different questions. Where shall I go on holiday this year? I've done the Maldives, I've done the Caribbean, I've done Australasia. What's left? What about a world cruise? Mm, should I get a new electric car? Oh, what about that Porsche electric car? 140,000, incidentally. I need an extension to my house to accommodate all of the kids' quad bikes. Well, maybe you're not one of those. Maybe you're not one of the first group. Maybe you're in the middle with, you know, enough. And maybe you're not kept uh, awake at night. And that's, that's great. But maybe you're like many people thinking, well, I've got enough. But wouldn't it be nice to have that little bit more? Then I could fill in the blanks. And a lot of people are like that. I'm not saying necessarily Christians, but why do people do the lottery every week? To me, it's a no-brainer whether you're a Christian or not. But nevertheless, they do because they want that big win. Or maybe not the big, big win because you read stories of people who've had that big, big win and they never seem to find happiness. Funny that, isn't it? But just enough so that I can pay off the mortgage I can go on that cruise, those kind of things, looking for a bit more. Well, all those groups, all those groups are never satisfied. And we know, don't we, the only way to find true satisfaction is in Jesus Christ. Our world is full of inequality. We know that, don't we? There's those with a lot, those with a little. There's the rich West. There's the developing world. The global North, the southern nations. You see it on the TV and we have a responsibility to God to use what he's given to us well. Even in our own nation there are perceived inequalities. We do speak, don't we, of deprived areas. Different generations, different groups of people, different income levels. So what is the Christian response to this? In Proverbs chapter 30 and verses 7 to 9, Agur prayed for God to give him just what he needed. Neither poverty nor riches to keep him from the sort of cares of the world that we've already been thinking about well hopefully we are in a, a situation where we're not worrying about such things but we need to come back all the time to scripture to put the perspective of rich and poor which is the heading I have from the word of God and James chapter 1 I'm just concentrating on a tiny little passage really verses 9 through to 11 James, remember, in his letter, is writing primarily to early Jewish believers. They're from a Jewish background. They've become Christians. And he's writing to help them in their walk and witness. When I was here a few months ago, we did the first eight verses. And it talked about trials. They were having a tough time. Well, he now puts in some perspective to help them a bit more further. These Jewish background believers would have been probably quite poor. They would have lost a lot. They'd have lost their contacts. They'd have lost their support groups because they've become Christians. They may well have been dispersed. And so James is writing to them to seek to encourage them a bit. In verses 2 to 7, he's told them you will have trials. And here is an example of trials of life. Poverty and prosperity. Here he's bringing us a word from God 
which will help us cope, help them cope as well, with life in the real world. The groundwork has been laid. Verses 2 to 4 tell us trials should be an occasion for joy. While the wisdom necessary for this not undaunting task should be sought from the Lord. And now here we go into this practical application. The first one, later on in James's letter, he returns to this kind of theme. Uh, but let's just home in on these verses today. James is not giving them a program for increasing their wealth. He's asking them to look at where they are and to commit their way to God. His immediate concern is to take a look at both poverty and prosperity and to view them both equally as tests of the reality of our personal faith in Christ. So, just going to look at them under the two headings really. First of all, the believers in humble circumstances, that's the lowly brother mentioned in verse 9. And then we go on to the rich people. Many Christian brothers and sisters across the world live in humble circumstances. And the sort of people we have in view here at the start of verse 9, these lowly brothers, are described as, in humble circumstances, poor. In the old King James Version, it was brothers of low degree. Basically, is someone in a low social position, often materially poor too, of no standing in the eyes of others. Given the contrast that is going to be made with the rich, it's pretty certain that they won't have two farthings to rub together, or whatever that phrase is. They are not going to be rich. They are the sort of people, and these Jewish background believers were finding it, who will suffer social ostracism. Maybe they're just holding on to a low-paid job because the employer can't get anybody else. We've got people, we've got brothers and sisters like that today, haven't we? You must have heard of the brick kiln workers over in Pakistan, the bonded labourers, and they're predominantly, if not entirely, Christians take out a loan for their equipment and so on, and they, they're stuck in a kind of almost modern slavery sort of situation. Possibly a Muslim boss in charge. And they can't get out of it. Some organisations like Barnabas Fund seek to provide funds to help them out of that situation. But they're just one example. There are so many true believers across the world who don't have very much at all in terms of worldly goods and are looked down upon, second-class citizens. These are the people in view here. We may not feel like that. But we, in our society, are becoming more and more marginalised, aren't we? We are being looked down upon for being bigots, for being fundamentalists, for holding fast to our faith. And you do read of Christians who are losing good jobs or just losing any job because they are standing firm for Christ. And we need to encourage such people too. It's going to get worse, I think. Being poor, these Christians invite ridicule. <laughs> God isn't looking after you. We must avoid those siren voices. To be a Christian is not easy. Jesus said it would not be easy. We are going to find it increasingly difficult. Some will give up. Hopefully not many. And the Lord will not lose them if they are truly his. But what is the lowly brother what is this person who is in humble circumstances to do? Well, verse 9 tells us they are to glory 
in their exaltation. NIV says, take pride in their high position. I like that. Makes a bit more sense. The message of the gospel to even the poorest and most destitute Christian is that in Christ, you are a somebody. You're not a nobody. You're not marginalised. You're in the best position of all however materially lacking you may be James says the poor believers are to consider their exaltation wow you are part of the family of Christ you're part of the body of Christ spiritually James tells them you have it made There's an incredible inheritance to look forward to. All that the Father has for his Son is yours in Christ. You're in the best possible situation that you could be in. Don't think about, don't dwell on earthly riches. They only waste away. Set your mind on things above, where moth and rust don't corrupt. Just look to Christ. The example of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, he had nowhere to lay his head, did he? He had no real riches, but yet he is the Lord of glory. Fix your eyes on Jesus, James is saying. Rejoice in your salvation. Glory in it. Literally, it means boast. And it's not that horrible boasting. It's the boasting of someone who is so full of praise for the one who's done everything for them it's not what you've done it's what he has done well it's something that we should take to heart we should think on we should as we perhaps are tempted to feel downcast or fret look to the Lord Jesus Just remember what you were. You were nothing because you were dead in your sins. You were in the mud. He came. He lifted you out. You're going to be with him in the heavenlies. Surely can you not glory in this. In our society, there are far more people than have than have nots when we compare ourselves with other parts of the world yet even Christians I say even Christians lots of Christians are obsessed with getting more but these are the things of this world they won't last they perish what we should be obsessed with possibly is knowing more of Christ in getting closer to him to being living a life of holiness before him We should boast glory in our salvation. Well, that's the the lowly brothers. But let's look at the other side of the coin. And we should start, I guess, by reminding ourselves it's not wrong for a Christian to be rich. Throughout history, there have been notable examples of well-off believers. That's why we have the John Lang thing. Because... He was a true believer, but he had a right attitude to the wealth that he had earned. Some of you may have heard of Selina, the Countess of Huntingdon. She was part of the nobility, but she enabled great gospel work to take place in the 18th century. A member of the nobility, a countess, can't be saved. Of course she can be saved. She was. And there are plenty of others. You've got your William Wilberforces. You've got people who are rich in terms of the world. And are believers, true believers. And can do a lot for Christ because of that. There aren't a load. There aren't that many. But it's not wrong to be rich. It's what you do with it. In the scriptures, you read of people like Lydia, don't you? Successful businesswoman who became a founding member of the church at Philippi. 
So there's nothing wrong with riches as such, but it's our attitude to them that's important. I remind you of Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, in verse 8 of James chapter one, James has told his readers not to be double-minded. Now there it's in the context of believing and not doubting. Clinging on to the things of the world as well as having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to put riches in God's perspective. He takes no account of how well off we are. We can't buy our way into heaven. We can't buy having masses said for us so that we get to heaven, that kind of thing. Went out with the Middle Ages, didn't it? And it didn't work then. Building a new chapel. No, no, no. The rich person is to take pride, it says here, in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. He, or she, the rich person, like everyone else, is a sinner. And if they're a Christian, it's only through God's grace that he or she has been saved. This word, humiliation, speaks of the fact that such a person's status before God is totally different to that of the world. Their status in the world is of no account to God. Rich believers, well off and secure in their possessions with great status in the eyes of the world need to remember that in the eyes of God they are as nothing. They're like that poor, poor man that they see outside their gate. Their only security, rich or poor, comes from their relationship with the man of sorrows, the man of suffering, despised and rejected by man. So, a rich person needs to think very carefully about where their trust is. You can be a rich Christian, but there are so many distractions. Be warned. And we're all rich. We are in that rich West, aren't we? We need to be very careful about what we are trusting in. Because James goes on very reasonably to just state the obvious. Because as a flower of the field, the rich person will pass away. And he talks about that, giving it as a a picture really in verse 11. You get a flower, comes up, as soon as the sun scorches, particularly in Israel would have been the case, that flower will wither within a little while. Now I don't know about you, uh, if you go along the road uh, to Great Missingdon, Uh, the Missingdon Road and on the right there it's it's lovely June time certainly in the past two or three years there's been a great big field of red poppies I don't know if anyone's seen it it's been on Facebook I think as well absolutely fantastic first time I saw it I was totally bowled over I'd never seen anything quite like that Um, but within three four weeks gone I suppose if I'd gone close to I'd have seen them all floppy and dead But that's the picture. That's the picture. We bloom for a few years, 70, 80, 90, whatever it happens to be, or less. And we're gone. Just like that. And that is the perspective that we should have. We should have 
the thought in our mind that we should seize the day, that we should do what we can for God now. This picture here of a desert flower is us. We're little flowers. I don't know about you, but it seems like only yesterday when I was young and able to do lots of things that I can't do now. And it's a truism, isn't it? It's a truism. We lose friends. We lose family members. And one day we too will stand before God. So we need to live our lives in a way that pleases him on this earth. Life is short. We shouldn't live it for the accumulation of riches. We shouldn't live it fretting about everything. We should live it for God. James is going to go on in his letter in chapter 4 to speak about the dangers of riches in terms of our thought processes and relationship with others. But here he is underlining the fact that the only way to be safe is to be humiliated by God. To actually humble yourself before God. To say, Lord, I'm so grateful for what you've given me, but how can I use it in your service? So the question for all of us, whatever riches we do or don't have, is this. What are your priorities? Worldly distinctions of class are not important in God's kingdom. They mean nothing. Do you look down on fellow believers who perhaps who you think are profligate with what they've got? No, we should look to ourselves first, shouldn't we? Get that beam out of our eye before we get the speck from theirs. We shouldn't look down or look up on anyone because of their social standing or resources. The church in Corinth had to learn this the hard way. If you go through 1 Corinthians chapter 11 particularly and see what they were doing at the Lord's Supper, you'll realise that they had kind of status, people with status who thought they had in the church and those who hadn't. And it was classes of Christians. Should not be so. Should not be so. We are all sinners Saved by grace if we're a believer here this evening. So, there's the challenge. It's, it's something really that comes to each one of us. And it's, it's kind of akin to what Jesus challenged his disciples and his followers to do. Remember the parable of the talents? Well, we should use whatever God has given us for his glory... We should be living lives that please him and that we should be pleased to do so. And in all that we do, we just got to give him thanks for all that he's done for us. For he is a great God, isn't he? Amen. He's given us everything in Christ Jesus. Why should we worry about these other things? When we're, if we're fretting in the middle of the night about whatever it happens to be, bring it to him, look to him and that perspective and that look on him will make everything seem so different. Looking to Jesus, everything else becomes as nothing. For he should be our all. And he is, isn't he? Amen. Let's give him the praise and the honour and the glory. Amen.